Freeman, a novel by Leonard Pitts Jr. Freeman begins at the end of the Civil War, and the book follows three main characters. Tilda, a former slave woman who has now technically been emancipated by the end of the Civil War and the Emancipation and the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, her, I guess you could say, estranged husband, Sam Freeman, who was also formerly a slave but managed to uh, escape to the North. And um, he also served in the... Um, he also served during the war. And um, the third main character is Prudence Kent. Uh, she's a white woman from Boston whose father is quite wealthy, so she's grown up right, rather comfortably compared to the other two main characters of the story, and um, sort of offers a different perspective. Her as someone from the North going to the South, and the other two as people from the South who had first-hand experience as slaves. Freeman sort of offers a different perspective on the end of slavery and the aftermath of the Civil War. Through those three different characters, it shows different perspectives on what it might have been like to be essentially a human being that's the property of another human being, and then suddenly find yourself with the supposed newfound freedom, while also trying to exist in close proximity to people that formerly owned you and weren't very enthused about the idea of having to give up their property trying to navigate the legal freedom that you'd achieve, but then also the social, I guess, quasi-enslavement that still existed for a lot of people that lived during that time. For Sam Freeman, he also had some adjustments to make as a black man and also as a former slave. You know, technically the government had given him his freedom and he was now supposedly a, you know, regular U.S. citizen, but still navigating a society that wasn't quite ready to see him in that way, that wasn't quite ready to accept him as an equal or see him as a full citizen or even just as a man or human being. So um, that was quite interesting. Tilda had been beaten down by slave life to the point where she'd stopped dreaming of freedom. And when freedom presented itself, she was uneasy about it. She didn't know what it meant. She couldn't even wrap her eye, she couldn't even wrap her mind around the idea. It was just so far outside of what she'd come to expect as being a possibility for herself. As a result, you know, she's afraid of really even trying to explore what it means to be free, moving beyond the control of her master. I mean, as part of that is that her master is actually pretty or her former master, I should say, is actually like a crazy guy. Um, he's lost everything as a result of uh, the Civil War. His family's died off through disease and other events and things of that nature. He's lost his property. He's now pretty much a destitute. And, you know, in some ways, aside from socially speaking, he's not much better off than Tilda. They actually share quite a number of similarities in their experiences. Regardless of the end of the of the Civil War and that the government has now proclaimed her as being free, he still sees her as his property. And given that he was a part of the rebel army and, you know, doesn't really recognize this, you know, this Yankee government, he refuses to accept the idea that she's no longer his property. You know, um, the South has lost the war. He sees it as a great assault insult to his ego and as a result he sees it as the government trying to take one more thing from him in that the south has lost this war that they fought and the north is now attempting to add further insult to injury by proclaiming the slaves as being free by taking over their property and from his perspective his rationale is that he bought her fair and square uh through legal means, and so she's therefore his property. And he refuses to accept the idea that with the end of the war and being on the losing end, he now has to release her. He actually refuses to do so and decides instead to leave Mississippi behind and to go west uh, into land that hasn't been, in his mind, corrupted by the government where men can still be men and he can have the freedom that he's seeking from the overreaching northerners. He's actually heavily armed and 
harsh individual, violent. Tilda, as they march along, is very terrified, especially given some events that take place rather early in the book. Of the three characters, I was most drawn to Tilda because of her vulnerability and the seeming hopelessness of her circumstances. She's a very sympathetic character. Um, just through the things that she's that we learn about her that she's gone through and then also the things that she has to deal with during the time period of the book itself um, the losses that she's endured having a family broken up and you know in and of itself just existing in slavery as a human but then also the you know specific injustices she's faced as a woman um, Tilda's story is heartbreaking and it is heavy and a lot of just very soul crushing things happen to her and have happened to her over the course of her life but reading about it is very heavy and so typically I like books that focus on one character because they can get more deeply into character development and things like that and the story can just dive a lot more deeper the other two characters of the book I didn't like quite as much, but by the end of the book I understood why they were there. They were actually really needed to sort of balance out the book, because I think had the entire book just been about Tilda, it would have been just really draining and overwhelming. So having these two other characters sort of helped to not so much alleviate that, that pain, because they had their own struggles and hardships, but just helped to help to give you a little breather from um from Tilda's hardships. One of the other characters of the book is Sam Freeman. Starting with the book, I actually thought that Sam was a bit of a snob. He made it a point not to scrape and bow, which I completely understood, but I thought he was a snob because he not just showed that he was competent and capable and, you know, a fully fleshed human being with his own thoughts and feelings, but he actually went out of his way to show that he was better than the other black characters of the book. In some ways, he was trying to prove his humanity, but... The way that he went about it sort of rubbed me the wrong way. In some ways, I'm sure that it was a matter of um, of his ego, a way of building himself up by putting on this, um, by just trying really hard to present himself as being as being more than uh, the limited expectations and the stereotypes that would be cast upon uh, black people during this time. He was insufferable for much of the book, but as the story progressed, I grew to understand and sympathize with the way he tried to mask his insecurities. It became more evident that Sam wasn't trying to belittle the black people around him. He was insecure due to the limitations and stereotypes that would that had been forced upon him by society so he went out of his way to prove his humanity to prove his intelligence to prove his capabilities by putting them on full display at any opportunity he had uh, in normal conversations he'd use like big words to make up just to prove how smart he was he'd go out of his way to you know quote lines from obscure books that he just proved that he'd read and that he was a learned man. In normal conversation, in some situations, it just seemed so unnecessary, but as the book went on, I came to understand why he did it. He was trying to show that he was human being, that he, he possessed the ability to think. He wasn't this simple creature. He was a human being with thoughts, feelings, emotions, and intellect. And he wanted to be seen in that way. He didn't want to be seen as less than. He wanted to be seen as a fully complex human, as the fully complex human being that he really was. And so when situations arose where this was challenged, where people attempted to speak down to him or attempted to really question his humanity, he went out of his way to, to, show, to give a glimpse into what he was capable of and to put his intellect and things like that on display. Prudence Kent, on the other hand, I started out the book not liking and I ended the book pretty much hating. Prudence is from a completely different world from the other two characters. She's been raised in New England and Boston to be specific by a wealthy father. Her father was an immigrant from Europe who came to America penniless and 
uh, made a fortune through a furniture business. The furniture business had actually been founded by a former slave. Those two characters have a place in Prudence's mind as being these very upstanding individual. But as the book progresses and we learn more about these two characters and, and things they've done in the past, um, you sort of come to realize that there's the the legend of these people, as in the the story they've put forth about how they came to be the people they were, or really just about who they were. These um, sort of fabled legends that painted them as being larger than life and, you know, beyond reproach and just being really perfect. We come to see later on, you know, through as the story unfolds, that they weren't, they weren't really evil men, at least not completely, but that they weren't quite, their stories weren't quite what they'd made them out to be that they were both imperfect men it actually points to a major theme in the book where there's the the public face and the public expectation that are passed upon people and then the people that they truly are within themselves so for example with tilda and sam tilda isn't even viewed as being a human being sam is sort of like a half human in the sense that no nobody owns him anymore but they're not really viewed as being fully competent and capable human beings. They're placed in these very limiting boxes where uh, they sort of live under the expectations of stereotypes. They're not viewed as being individuals with their own thoughts, feelings, and things of that nature. On the flip side of that, you have um, you have uh, Prudence's father and... Uh, his business partner, who have these uh, histories as being these really great men that were philanthropic and caring about other people and things of that nature. But then we come to find out that, you know, in their sort of hidden past, that they've also taken advantage of people, that they've used their uh, generosity to sort of make up for past sins. Um, in addition to that, Prudence, who sets out from Boston to Buford, uh, Mississippi, I believe, to establish a school that her father um, wished to have created after his passing, comes across quite a number of characters in the South who also present a facade of being genteel, but it actually masks quite a bit of uh, hate and... Um, you know, capability for great violence. Uh, so it's sort of a theme that carries throughout the book, the idea of this public and private face, the, the face that characters present to the public, the way that they want to be seen, and then the private face, which is the person that they really are, the, the things that they've done in their lives that other people don't necessarily know about. In some cases, it's the the hardships and injustices they face, such as with uh, Sam Freeman and Tilda, and then on the other hand, there are the you know people that have done not so nice things in life, like um, uh, Prudence's father and his business partner, and then some of the other people that she comes across in the South. Of the characters, Prudence was a little bit different in the sense that I started out the book pretty much disliking her and really just hated her at the end of the book. That her supposed, she's sort of portrayed as being like this brave character that, you know, is a little bit reckless but well-meaning and she's like, you know, out to champion and do the right thing at all costs and I just really, it, I just thought she was a moron. Her supposed acts of bravery and determination were really just recklessness and stubbornness. Uh, she was foolhardy and made rash decisions without fully thinking them through. And in quite a number of situations, I thought that she was actually quite selfish because she made decisions without thinking them through, without considering how they would affect other people, but having the consequences of her actions or her ideas being things that will greatly impact the lives of other people around her. 
But, you know, even in these situations where, where the things she did, the actions she took, could have major consequences for the people around her. Like, she just didn't take the time to consider how other people might feel or how other people might be affected or impacted. It was just something that just really turned me off from her and just... It, it sort of snowballed as the book progressed because she'd make pretty reckless decisions and things would sort of have a way of working out and she'd take this as license to continue making these reckless decisions because she hadn't really faced any consequences for her rash decisions. She sort of continued to take license with making these kinds of decisions. Bonnie, uh, Prudence's really good friend and actually someone that she grew up with, sort of like sisters. But unlike uh, Prudence, Bonnie's a black woman. So they've had, they've grown up in the same household, but have had somewhat different circumstances. Bonnie hasn't been born in the South and uh, being, I believe she was actually born a slave, being purchased by, um, Prudence's father, along with her mother, and uh, being taken to the north where uh, they were freed and things like that. I believe they're actually freed in the south and taken north. Uh, but yet still, Bonnie had some, I believe Bonnie was quite small when she made the journey to the north, but she had some knowledge of, of how different life was for people that looked like her, meaning people that were black in the South versus the life and experience that she'd had in the in the North. And actually that that um that comes into play uh once Prudence and Bonnie move to the South to establish the Cafferty School. Bonnie, unlike Prudence, is living a rather comfortable life. Uh they, it's a middle class, upper middle class household, but Bonnie is not one of Mr. Cafferty's children, you know, she just lives in his house. Um, she doesn't have a mother of her own. She doesn't have her own family. She doesn't have a, a real life of her own. You know, there's sort of this life that she's just grown up within, uh, or this household that she's grown up within. And as a result of that, she experiences some loneliness and a sense of otherness living within this household. Um, I sympathize with her sense of loneliness and unease. I was happy for her as the book progressed and it seemed like she might, like things might be turned around for her. She might have an opportunity to experience ha the happiness of the sense of belonging and having her own family and these kinds of things that it seems she'd been longing for. It's like I held out hope through the book that she would get tired of prudence and her nonsense and would just leave her behind. Some of the major themes of the book were navigating newfound freedom and exploring what it really means to be free. There's that perspective from Tilda and Sam as these two former slaves who are now navigating legitimate freedom. And on the other side of it, there is, I guess, to some degree, Prudence as well, who during this time as a woman, she would still face some restrictions in society, but essentially has her father's wealth and her now physical freedom, having moved to the South to establish the school away from her family, where she sort of has the freedom to do as she pleases. And we see, you know, how things work out in the book for the two different sides of that uh, perspective. On the one hand, uh, people who have been denied freedom for much of their lives and have now suddenly been given it, and then on the other hand, someone who has had relative freedom throughout much of their life through their family wealth and their uh, status in society. Another major theme is the idea of reconnecting on a whole with loved ones and then also with places that you'd left behind. So, for example, um, Sam major goal throughout the book is reconnecting with Tilda. He sets out from Philadelphia uh, and heads back south to in hopes of finding Tilda and reconnecting to her and you know it's not really clear what his expectations are but I guess at the very least just seeing this person again that he shared you know, such momentous life occasions with, seeing where that kind of goes along the way. Another theme that's touched on in the book is that both sides in the conflict around slavery saw themselves as being victims. 
where uh, Tilda, San, and the other former slaves in the book had experienced true hardship as a result of being slaves. I mean, having your humanity pretty much stripped away from you and being seen and treated as chattel. On the flip side of that, you then had the slaveholders who'd experienced the loss in war and the loss of their slaves as a result of the emancipation of slaves and um, now viewed themselves as well as being victims that the lives that they built for themselves, the promises that society had made to them as being landowners and slaveholders, that pretty much the world that they knew had now fallen apart. We see the two sides trying to navigate that, where on the one side they're more driven towards violence and trying to seek retribution for the manner in which they believe they've been wronged, and then on the other side you now have these people trying to navigate freedom and experience in a world that is openly hostile towards them. You know, there's a, a, within that, there's this major loss of identity where the person you knew yourself as, the way you viewed yourself, the world as you knew it has now shifted and changed. The, the way that you're viewed in society is shifted and changed. There's this huge loss of identity and then the exploration of what it means to, to redefine that following the end of the Civil War. Overall, I enjoyed the book. It was an emotional roller coaster that really had me in my feelings at quite a few points, but some of the drawbacks I felt was that the, the language felt a little bit hokey at points, but overall I'd recommend the book. I think um, it's a pretty quick read. I read it in I think maybe a week or two. Just be prepared to, to be in your feelings at some point. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button and subscribe to the Noir Histoire channel and visit noirhistoire.com for more book and movie reviews in addition to black history facts and profiles of black historical figures. While you're there, sign up for the newsletter to get fresh content delivered straight to your inbox. If you prefer to listen on the go, subscribe to the Noir Histoire podcast via iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Follow Noir Histoire on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Tumblr, and Google+. Thanks again for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day.